Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for our webinar, Understanding Credit Basics. My name is Kelly Blount, and I'm the Program Marketing Specialist here at General Electric Credit Union. We're so glad you've joined us as we have a lot of great content ahead, and we wanted to thank you all for tuning in from the comfort of wherever you may be tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Todd Moore with Trinity Debt Management to introduce himself and take us through tonight's topic. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. It's great to be back with General Electric Credit Union and particularly talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, credit. Um, as you know, if you follow the webinar series, General Electric Credit Union and Trinity has partnered on finding ways to help you improve your credit, expand credit capacity, um, address credit scoring. And tonight we're going to continue on that theme really diving deeper into credit, having that conversation once again. The goal of the webinar series and the goal of tonight's presentation is really to empower you to make certain that uh, those who are on the call, that we can strengthen credit capacity and help our, our community really move forward. And from the credit union, certainly we are uh, hoping that we can meet your credit needs. So wanted to dive in tonight and really walk us through understanding just some strong fundamentals of credit, why credit's important, how to strengthen your score, and really if you've had some issues with your credit capacity through time, empower you with some tools that you can use long after the presentation that you can go back, watch the video, look into the guide, and really just move yourself forward this year. So as we know, Credit is one of those crucial elements that we have to have to fully participate in the economy. So when we think about credit, and we use that term in a lot of different ways, and I'll be sharing that tonight, but when we think about credit, really what we're talking about is the capacity to borrow, the capacity to really fully function in our economy. And that comes in various forms, whether it's student loans, car loans, home loans, those things that we think about that really are at the core of building wealth and at the core of moving into the middle and upper class in society. That's one of the beauties of having credit is making certain that we have access to future funds that really can expand our capacity as in our personal finances, homes and other things that we may finance. But also when we think about, uh, we may have some folks on the call that are thinking about being a future business owner, those sorts of things. So. It is, it's just incredibly important that we not only understand the tools and how to use credit, how to strengthen our capacity, but to really be able to understand, you know, what credit is, why it's important, and how to strengthen overall capacity through time. Many of us know that, you know, in the last couple of years, I almost hate to say it, but, but as we've gone through COVID, you know, folks have had some challenges. Interest rates have continued to go up. I know that I've watched interest rates continue at, through inflation to can, continue to rise. Folks sometimes have an issue with maintaining their credit capacity. So in this journey of life, we have ebbs and flows, and certainly that reflects in our credit capacity. The goal tonight, though, is really to help us move forward and, again, to make certain that at the credit union that we can meet your needs and, and you know and I, and I believe very strongly in general electric credit unions capacity to do that so um you know credit at its core is a contractual agreement okay so what we're asking when we think about credit broadly what we're doing is we're asking folks to loan us money um and you know i thought it was interesting as well that when we think about this notion of expanding credit in, in some capacity some of you may want to take a look at david graber's book uh, I have that listed on the presentation slide, the first 5,000 years. There are some interesting details and things in there about lending practices and how that was historically. But um, the concept of credit really is, it's a very old concept. This, this agreement between finding ways or finding things of value to exchange and being able to, to expand the capacity uh, for you to finance things through time. And one of the beauties of having a credit, having credit capacity from an individual perspective and having lenders that are able to meet your needs is that, you know, think about what we cannot finance with cash. Credit allows us to have that capacity, it allows us to finance, you know, things through time that we would not otherwise be able to pay for. So when we get into the various types of credit, I um, wanted to share with you, these are some of the common types that we often think about. We'll get into some terminology. 
but um, one of the things here, let's take a look at these three kind of fundamental concepts or three fundamental types of credit. We think about revolving installment and service credit. Now, what's interesting about this is that each of these functions somewhat differently. Uh, we may have some folks on the call that are rebuilding their credit capacity. We may have some folks that are in early stages that are trying to establish credit. Um, we ha may have some folks just looking to improve their overall score. Okay, well, each of these types, you know, also have uh, credit scoring implications as well. So it's, it's important that we kind of understand what these types of credit, uh, what these types are, how they function, and uh, whether, you know, what's the credit score impact uh, and usage of these types of credit. So when we're looking at revolving credit, you know, this term itself, you can almost think of any major credit card. Okay, these are, these are those cards that are surrounding us at all times, whether it's Best Buy or any number of different cards that you see on the market um, that are specific to stores. Uh, any major credit card uh, that you would have is a revolving line of credit. The idea here is that um, you make purchases so long as you stay under the credit limit, which can change over time. There's a monthly payment attached to that. And, um, <clears throat> you know, you have a certain credit line up to a certain amount. Okay, and these are the ones, revolving lines are the ones that we typically see, just think about how broad the actual credit card market is. These are the types of things that we see when we get overextended uh, or when folks really um, uh, get stuck making only monthly minimum payments, which we'll talk about later. But the core concept here with this type of line is that, you know, this can, um, it's a credit card that is basically, you have a certain limit, that limit can change. If your capacity goes up or your score moves up, those credit limits tend to expand, okay? Um, and oftentimes when there's non-use of a credit card, uh, those credit lines can be diminished. I know recently, um, because I didn't use a JCPenney card for a while, um, my card was uh, cut down. <laughs> So I lost some of my credit capacity through that card, but understand that type of credit and what that is. We call that a revolving line of credit. The next that I'll share with you is what we call a, an installment line. Uh, pretty straightforward here. If you look at the examples, if we think about mortgages, student loans, car loans, you know, these are bank loans where you have a spe specific sum of money and that you repay that over a certain amount of time. Okay, so it's got a time dimension to that, you know, 24 months, 25 years, whatever it may be. So you have a fixed amount that is established through time, installment lines of credit, very, very common. And these are the, these two types, revolving installment uh, types of credit certainly are the two big ones when it comes to personal finance, uh, particularly as we think about, you know, car loans, mortgages, those sorts of things. These are the big ticket items that we finance through longer uh, installment lines of credit. But, um, you know, we think about, again, that notion of fully participating in our economy, having access to things. These are the two lines that really build, this is what builds wealth for us through time. You know, we have to have a score that is strong to be able to apply for various types of loan products that we need. And then we're trying to finance these larger ticket item, items, um, particularly mortgages, uh, you know, as, as we're building wealth through time. So these are the two big ones. Uh, certainly the credit score is going to pay or, or play an important part in being able to access larger amounts of money uh, and larger loans. But these two um, are very, very important core to, you know, you know, everyday usage and the types of loans that we need to build a strong, what we call a credit mix, which I'll be discussing that later in the presentation slides. So both of these lines, revolving installment lines, are credit score dependent, okay? So I'll explain what that means. I mean, um, oftentimes we will, and you can take note of this, minimum score requirements. So let's say, for instance, that you want to apply for um, a Best Buy credit card. That's gonna have a minimum score requirement in itself. Or you may be applying to the credit union for a particular credit card that may have a specific um, number attached to it as well. In fact, it will um, have a minimum score requirement. Installment lines, it works the same way. 
there's going to be an, a minimum score requirement. Now, when it comes to mortgages, there's all various types of mortgage loans that are, are available and servicers for those types of loans. You know, some loans are going to be as low as a 640 credit score. But when we think about these two types of credit, it's very important that we also think that one, there's always a minimum score requirement involved in both revolving and installment, and that interest rates will vary depending on our overall credit score. Okay, so when we think about these two lines, obviously the higher the credit score, the better the interest rate and the larger amount of money that we're able to obtain in terms of a loan amount. But when we get into things like installment lines, where credit scores also are very, very important, particularly for first time home buyers or folks who are entering into obtaining you know, equity lines of credit, all those sorts of things, both of these lines are very credit score dependent. So it's always the case that we're aiming to strengthen our overall credit score, raise that score as high as we can to get the best terms and interest rate, interest rates and loan amounts. And we'll be discussing, you know, uh, the credit score uh, component here uh, soon. Now, when we think about revolving installment, it's important thinking about it in terms of its credit scoring. Both of these certainly um, are accounts that are reported to the major credit bureaus. Differs somewhat from what we call service credit. Okay, so service credit, think about cell phone company, gym memberships, uh, cable company. There's all sorts of variation on this. Services that you obtain, well, oftentimes what we're looking at here is while we're making payments, it doesn't necessarily get reported to a credit bureau. And, you know, there's folks that have really tried to do, you know, you may have heard of Experian Boost where it says, you know, rental payments, for example, can be used for credit scoring purposes or trying to find utility payments, things like that to get get those types of service lines of credit to report to a credit bureau. Um, I've, I've done some work on those. Um, I can tell you just in practical terms, um, it, it's not as strong in the score uh, you know, outcome as I would have hoped. Um, but the key difference here is that this service lines of credit, it really doesn't get reported the same way generally um, you know, as, of, as opposed to the two main types that we're talking about here, what we call revolving and installment lines of credit. And just to share something with you that I've seen, oftentimes folks who are new to credit or what we call a thin file, not a lot of information there. Sometimes one of the worst things that could happen is you walk into the credit union or, or you apply for a line and you're rejected, and that leaves a lasting impact on folks. It really does because, you know, the first thing is, man, why did I not get this line of credit? But it's important to understand, again, that when you're applying for revolving or installment lines of credit, there's always that minimum score requirement. So I would always suggest to you, you know, walk in and sit down and talk with a loan officer at the credit union. Ask what those minimum score requirements are. Build that relationship with the credit union. It does mean something. It's not just a term that we throw around ask questions. That's why we do the seminar. That's why we're involved in the webinar series. It's why we really do this work because we want you to come in. We want you to be engaged in the process. When you ask those types of questions, hey, I'm interested in a credit card. You know now it's a revolving line and, and how that functions. But ask those types of questions. What's the minimum score requirement for this line? You know, here's why I need it. You know, I'm interested in the installment line of credit. That comes in many, many different forms. You know, so if you're if you're looking at these types of lines of credit, these are the things that are really going to build your capacity through time. Service credit not reported at the same way unless you're using something like Experian Boost, not reported to a credit report. Therefore, it's not an active or open account for credit scoring purposes. So these two major lines of credit that we're talking about, very very important to, to create you know a strong credit mix and to really be able to use these two lines to fully participate in all varieties in our economy. So if you have any questions about that, again, you know, please take note of those. I know I'm throwing a lot at you quickly, but please take note of some of the things we talked about. Put that in the chat or certainly ask questions later. Um, the other thing too, as we talk about credit, sometimes we'll say, well, do you have, you know, 
is your credit strong? Okay, and often what we mean here is, do you have capacity? What's your credit history? What's your credit score? Most of us, I think, when we just use the term credit itself, we don't really get bogged down into the, you know, the, the obligation between the debtor and the creditor, that sort of stuff. It is an obligation. It's a legal obligation anytime you borrow money. Um, but when we're looking at just other definitions of credit, we offhandedly, I think, just say, hey, you know, do you have credit? What we're really looking at is our overall capacity, our credit score, okay? And, um, you know, credit scoring itself, um, what we're looking at here is a way to evaluate risk. That's really what this comes down to. So when we're thinking about if you're new to credit, um, you know, it's going to take, we're, we're going to show you through the presentation tonight that there are ways that we can establish a credit score um, using various products that the credit union provides. Um, there's also, for those that need a little work on their overall capacity, um, you know, if, if your score is lower, we have not only products and tools that we can use to improve the score, but we're going to look at ways to manage your debts differently um, and really just dive into your overall score to figure out what we can do to improve that score. Again, with the idea of going back and being able to borrow. Um, but this term, this term itself, and the reason I say other definitions of credit, we talked about, you know, installment lines and the types of credit. But I think, again, we offhandedly say, you know, you know, do you have credit? Really, what we're talking about here is credit scoring. And in this case, I've given you a couple examples, and this will vary. Um, if you notice here, FICO gives these ranges. The credit union is going to have, you know, again, minimum score requirements, and some of this will be done internally to evaluate risk, evaluate your credit capacity. Um, but these are some good guidelines to go by. So, you know, why do I point all this out? Well, one, we certainly want to make certain that we have a highest score that we can possibly get you. That's number one for interest rates and terms. But it also plays in to um, the ability of, of us to really take note of where we're at today and then where we're going to be, you know, come the end of this year. Um, I'm a big, you know, proponent of credit scoring and how it functions. And that's one of the reasons why I love the webinar series to work with folks, you know, and get a chance to talk about the importance of credit scoring and how it functions. But, you know, if you're in that range where you're not quite ready to apply for a home loan and you are really eager to start moving in to home ownership, you know, this is where, um, this is where we can really work together with the credit union. I can work with you through Trinity, but hoping that, you know, you really can walk away from the presentation tonight to understand how to raise your score and why that score is important. Again, sit down and talk with folks at the credit union. If your capacity, that is your score is lower than what it should be, ask those questions at the credit union. What is my minimum, what's the minimum score requirement for this particular line of credit? Here's what I'm aiming to do. This is where I'd like to go. And uh, we've got some great folks that will work um, not only to find ways to expand those lines for you, but we have the partnership that's required to help you reach that overall goal. So I want to pick back up for a moment, um, getting into, um, let's look at some, some pretty standard forms of credit cards, because I think credit cards is where we start to see, when we think about credit again, notice we're using that term again in a slightly different context, but we're thinking about credit. Credit cards is, we're surrounded by credit cards all the time. There's all sorts of credit card variation. Um, one thing that we don't want to get into doing um, is just applying, you know, if your score is lower and you're not at that minimum score requirement, and I see this all the time, just, uh, we don't want a bunch of inquiries, you know, a series of inquiries on our credit report. So if, you're, if your score is lower and you're out looking for a credit card, I want to slow you down in that process for a moment, okay? Again, reach out to the credit union and ask questions. But the way this typically works, with a lot of folks that I personally worked with, you know, we need lines of credit. Again, we're trying to finance something, we're trying to purchase something. So we're out on the market, folks will apply, we rack up a number of inquiries. Um, that's what we're hoping to avoid. You know, we want to change that behavior. Instead of doing that and applying randomly and hoping we get a line of credit, 
We want to sit down and have that conversation. Let's do this in a more methodical way, a more practical way that's based on credit scoring and moves us into the types of products that we need. One of those is going to be just what we call a standard credit card. Okay, what we what we all know as a standard credit card, we got a certain credit credit limit, the interest rates attached, we make a monthly minimum payment, that sort of stuff. Okay. Standard credit cards has a tremendous variation in interest rates, minimum score requirements, uh, you name it. Um, and, that, and the reason I go so far to say that is, again, some of you on the call may be interested in having a particular credit card for any number of different reasons, travel, build your credit, all sorts of reasons to have that. Um, maybe we have you know, folks that are, um, uh, younger that are building a credit card history. Uh, can we use a credit card to build that history? Those types of questions, we get into that. Um, standard credit cards can also, even with high interest rates, be used to reestablish, you know, a credit line after a, after a hardship. So there's wide variation on these types of cards. But um, the key here is that we understand how these cards function how to use them differently and you know can we find the right card to fit our needs and again that's why i continue to say sit down and have that conversation with the credit union so one of those tools that we would use if we're strengthening our credit rebuilding credit kind of you know maybe expanding our credit capacity standard credit cards great tool to use so long as we're using it um, using it well and we'll explain here soon what that means to use it well <laughs> Um, uh, we also see oftentimes out in the credit card market what we call reward cards. Um, again, when we look at these types of things, reward cards will typically be targeted to folks who have a higher credit score. There's rewards attached. <clears throat> You'll see this oftentimes. Airlines um, are a big fan of these types of cards. Uh, you rack up some miles, there's points, some type of point value or something, some type of uh, travel points or cashback points involved, some incentive for using that particular credit card. You'll see that in the market pretty often. Um, balance transfer cards that offer low introductory rates. You know, again, I'm going through these various types of credit cards because these are all tools that you use or can use for different reasons. So, you know, if you, when we're looking at just your standard credit card, Pretty straightforward usage comes, you can use it anywhere for any reason. Um, you know, it all will vary depending uh, on your credit score. And then in terms of depending on how large that balance is, your overall strength of your capacity. But let's say for instance, that you have a strong score and you have an opportunity to maybe do a balance transfer, low introductory rate, um, it can be a great tool to use, okay? You can transfer uh, a larger amount of debt onto, let's say for instance, that you have a, um, an outstanding balance with a higher interest rate. Your score is strong, okay? You have a longer history. There's a, there's a balance transfer option. The key here, if you're gonna use that tool, notice that it says low inter introductory rate. So these introductory rates are often provided, um, you know, I, I, there's sometimes folks will say, well, was I tricked? No, we got to know the details. And this is why I want you to be very familiar with these types of cards or types, these types of credit lines. So you get the low introductory rate that comes with a certain term. So it could be 12, 24 months. If you don't pay off the full balance after that time, and many of you on the call may know this, then you're at some default rate. Okay. So one, one word of caution on this is, you know, let's say that you're going to transfer some debt to a balance transfer card. Um, we just want to make certain that we're able to pay that amount within that period. Otherwise, we have to wonder, you know, was the rate that I transferred out of higher now on this other card? And will it change through time? And I've seen that happen many times. So we want to be cautious about that. Again, if you're going to use the tool, understand how to use this particular tool or line of credit appropriately. Um, we talked about, um, you know, folks who may be interested in, in business and starting a business or having a business credit line. All sorts of variation there, again, for folks who are business focused and looking for cards to 
uh, use for business purposes. Um, and then we get into two other areas um, with two different kind of segmented borrowers. So we got student credit cards. Let's think about the college market or what we call a secure credit card. I want to explain just a little bit about the variation in these two. So if we're thinking about student cards, which um, these are going to be cards, typically they'll have a higher interest rate for students, um, somewhere around $2,500, $3,000 credit lines. Again, it can be a wonderful tool for our students to be able to use those lines and establish credit, build credit while in college, if it's being used correctly. <clears throat> That's saying a lot. You know, college students, I was one of them too, who took on, you know, some debt and struggled paying it back um, with all the other things going on and just not working consistently uh, while in school. But there are cards there for our students, uh, particularly our younger folks who may need their first card. Um, again, there are many opportunities to sit down and talk with a credit union if you don't want to just go out into the market and start searching for a card on your own, okay? You know, you could always walk into the credit union, sit down and have that conversation with a loan officer that you're looking for a particular line of credit for a student. I would encourage you to do that as opposed to going out and saying, okay, which card should I apply for? You know, you can take a lot of that headache away by simply walking into the credit union and having that conversation. Um, but there are cards that can be um, obtained um, for our students to help them build and establish credit. Now, secured credit lines are kind of a unique category because they're not, unlike all the other lines of credit that we've talked about, secured credit lines are credit lines that are not credit score dependent. Okay, and I repeat that, not credit score dependent. That means you could have had a hardship, your credit score is really, really low, you're trying to figure out a way to improve your overall capacity, you've gotten rejected on a credit line, again, didn't have the minimum score requirement that's needed for that credit line. Secured cards just wipe all that away. Cash becomes collateral, that's that security deposit that's listed here on the slide. We can use, you know, for instance, three to $500 to get a secure credit card. You put cash up as collateral, you borrow against that money. The key here is that this is a beautiful tool. It's a wonderful tool to use when you're either, you know, building capacity, your overall score, or, you know, if you've had a hardship, could have been bankruptcy, charge off accounts, you name it, secure cards really do work in terms of rebuilding credit scores and just strengthening your overall credit capacity. Again, Using this tool, it's wonderful. I do um, work with folks, you know, on a weekly basis that get secured credit cards. And that comes not only in terms of a card, that's that revolving account that we talked about. There's also what we call installment secured line. So this could be maybe $1,200. You're paying on that through time. And the goal is that you've got something being reported every single month to your credit report, building your overall score through time. So lots of different tools here and types of credit. You know, what I'm trying to establish here is they all work somewhat differently. They all have similarities. The key is for you to understand when to use these, when not to go into this approach and how they function. We really want to know the details on these accounts so that you get the biggest benefit, not only in terms of how you're going to finance certain things, but that you can maintain those lines through time. Worst case scenario is you take on something, you know, particularly with the balance transfer, you can't pay it on time, you, and you've, you've created a bigger problem for yourself moving forward, or you've overextended yourself with various credit cards, you know, and it happens. Um, but wonderful tools to use. Again, know the types, know how to use them, and you know, and when to have some restraint as well. So. Um, just talk briefly again, um, go back to this notion of our standard credit cards. All interest uh, is going to be dependent on credit scores and capacity. So giving you a couple examples here, you know, if you see APRs that are higher, um, you know, the higher the APR, oftentimes when we think about APR, we, we use what's called segmentation. So if you look at the three major credit bureaus, 
TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. There's a lot of data that's captured through those three credit bureaus. All of us fall into some segmentation. That is, based on our credit score range, we're segmented into these various categories. So depending on our score range, that kind of establishes, you know, where APR will, there's a, there's an association between our segment or our score, where we, where we fall within that larger group, and, um, you know, what type of APR range is, is typically going to be attached to a particular line of credit. If you fall into that range where we have, you know, uh, really lower rate or introductory APR, those sorts of things for 12 to 18 months. Again, you've probably demonstrated a longer history. Um, you have a higher capacity, higher score, so that's a benefit through the credit market to be able to have that rate. Um, whereas you have these other rates that are higher, you know, that tends to fall again in terms of our overall credit scores. So just looking at this, you know, what we're really looking at here, um, whether there's, you know, some APR attached, I would I would say two things. One, understand the rates that are offered to you being dependent on overall capacity. But if you're someone on the call with us tonight and you have the opportunity to use even a higher interest rate card and you're reestablishing your overall credit capacity or you're new to credit and there's a higher APR, the whole goal here is to use it correctly or to use it well. Don't be afraid to use credit, okay? You know, it's fine to use credit. We need to use credit, again, to fully take advantage of opportunity. But we want to make certain that we're maintaining, you know, a low balance, keeping that card below 30%. We don't want to start racking up, you know, or maxing out a card, keeping those balances low, and then paying it in full every month it certainly is ideal. That's what we want to do. Um, and then the interest rate is not as significant as what it may look like. Again, interest is going to work against you when you're financing th through time, okay? That time dimension, that's what's going to cost you longer term. But the point here is, again, you know, you see a higher interest rate, you're new to credit or you're rebuilding your credit, you have a standard card, use it. Because if it's used correctly, there are many opportunities, despite the interest rate, for you to establish a strong score using the card, okay? And again, your different rates that are taken, uh, different rates that are provided to you, that's an opportunity because of your stronger capacity to go out, you know, finance some things that you really need, pay it at a lower APR, annual percentage rate, take advantage of that opportunity. Um, so don't, again, don't be afraid to use credit. Just understand that there is a proper way to do this <laughs> and uh, to avoid, you know, the long-term impact of credit, um, having your credit score diminish through time or paying high interest. So how do we go about doing that work? Um, want to encourage you, I call this best practices, but, you know, these are things that we really want to be very serious about. This first thing may seem fairly mundane. It's not you know, read your agreement. I'm not saying you need to read every fine detail, but here's a couple key things that you, read, you need to understand. You know, if you're struggling with your due date and you seem to, you know, need to change that date, you're paid every two weeks or there's just something happening where you're struggling with the 21st of that month, making that, you know, having that due date established, reach out to your lender immediately and let them know you need to change the due date. Now, you know, seems like a pretty straightforward thing, seems, you know, pretty routine. Well, if you're late, that's diminishing your score through time. You know, if you're continually late on your on your score, it is just weakening your overall credit score through time. Um, the other thing, interest rates, don't get entirely focused on interest rates, really keep those balances low, okay? That's the two things I'd like for you to really focus on. Don't be afraid to use the card, but use it, you know, be smart about your usage. You know, yes, you've got maybe a higher interest rate or you're focusing on the interest rate. If, you, if you're gonna fall into a category where you're late, pick up the phone, tell your lender you need to change your date that works for you, lenders will work with you, you know. Um, and then if you're worried about the interest rate, the way to kind of avoid, you know, the interest charges through time, keep your balances low. Above all things, we want to make certain that those payments are on time. Uh, when you look at credit scoring, 
this is going to fall into what we call payment history, number one factor in your credit score. So if we're just continually late, that really diminishes your score. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that impact here in a few minutes, but timely payments, cannot stress that enough. Timely payments is part of that payment history factor in your score. Late payments, it really does some damage. Paying more than the minimum, many of you have probably heard this before, but you know we can really fall into the debt trap just monthly minimum payments in itself this is where when we look at um just again we think about those standard credit cards that we're talking about this really can be a problem okay and i'm going to show you a couple examples of this but monthly minimum payments it really can expand not only um the time dimension how long it takes to pay off a card but then it's all the interest attached Okay, that's what we don't want to do. You max out a card, you make only a monthly minimum payment, or maybe you max out multiple cards and you're only making a monthly minimum payment. That's that debt trap that we can easily fall into. Very hard to get out of that. So aim to pay more than the minimum, keep your balance below that 30%. Um, and that's really what we're talking about here. And that next bullet point is what we call the utilization radio, uh, ratio, credit utilization ratio, <laughs> or credit debt ratio. Um, basically what we're saying is anytime you go beyond 30%, you take whatever that line is, okay, and you multiply it by 0 0.30. That's going to tell you once you cross that threshold, the further you get out, you know, utilization ratio from zero to a hundred, when you're maxed, you've done some damage at that point. Okay. Particularly if you're, if you're carrying multiple cards, it really, you start to see this interconnection between only paying the monthly minimum then having a higher interest rate and seeing your score really diminish through time, okay? You've weakened your capacity. So those are some very simple ways, but um, very, very important ways to not only maintain your score, uh, but to rebuild and strengthen your score through time. A couple examples here with interest rates. I pulled this from um, Capital One uh, credit card calculator. There are many calculators out there that you can Google, um, and even might even want you know, could even get amortization and things like that through the credit union that show you payoff uh, time frames. And I'm, I think even through the, the money management tool, there's probably something on there. I have to double check that. But um, this is just pulled off of the calculator. A couple quick examples here. Um, you know, here again, we're using this uh, interest rate. Um, this first example, this particular person is 18% interest rate making monthly minimum payments. And then, you know, you see the interest impact, 1578, $1,578 in interest. Okay, that's a monthly minimum payment, which is typically somewhere around 3% of the overall card balance. So when you look at a monthly minimum payment, it's somewhere around that 3%. Um, and it can vary depending on the, on the lender, but rule of thumb is it's monthly minimum payments are usually somewhere around that 3%. Um, but you start to see, you know, even I think in this case, you know, you look at just bumping that to 250 and there you've not only diminished the time, but the interest impact, you know, that's really what we're talking about. Um, now these examples are assuming I made something, I'm making the payment. You know, I didn't pay it down, you know, 50% and, you know, and I paid it all the way off through time and go out and use the card again. I'm, you can see where this really becomes a problem. Most of us, as we pay on the card with monthly minimum payments, we tend not to always pay off. So that interest just continues to go up. These examples just assume, okay, made a large purchase. I'm making a monthly minimum payment. Here's the impact. I think we know in practical terms that, that doesn't always well, it doesn't work in practice. We're usually using the card even after we've paid the monthly minimum payment or paid it down, we go out and charge again. The other uh, example that I've given you is with a lower score and you really start to see, I mean, look at the variation between these two um, interest rates and interest alone. I mean, 5,000 at 28% interest, you know, you're looking at 48 months and then $3,335 in interest. And again, that's just assuming that I made a large purchase and now I'm just paying it off within that 48 months. So that interest number only reflects, you know, a static 
<laughs> it's static. It's not moving through time. I didn't do anything else with the card. Long story short, if you're only making monthly minimum payments, the math speaks for itself. Okay, you just have to do a summary read of these numbers to see that it's very, very expensive. So we always want to find ways to make more than the monthly minimum. And again, caution yourself against going, you know, beyond that 30% credit debt ratio that I talked about. Um, that's where we can really get into some serious trouble. We're thinking about our longer term impact to our credit. All right, so we're moving fairly quickly. Um, these next few slides, um, I'm not going to go into great detail about scoring because we have uh, covered that topic before. I love talking about credit scoring. <laughs> so I'll use some restraint as we go through these next few slides. But, you know, again, if you have questions, please let us know um, any of the credit scoring questions that you have. And, um, you know, certainly be willing to work with you on any of the credit scoring questions long after the call. Again, when we're thinking about credit scoring, and thinking about your overall capacity. Where are you at today with your overall score? Okay. Um, you're going to see a relationship here between a higher score and the interest rates and the types of products and services that are offered to you. Now, I've covered a lot of that already. That's that uh, section that we talked about revolving installment lines. Um, so, certainly, uh, higher score, lower interest rates, and vice versa and the types of cards or products that we can use. So if our credit score is very low, maybe we don't have that minimum score requirement, but we can still work with the credit union to get a secured card, or we can get an installment line of 12 to $1,500 and build our score, okay? Or let's assume that our score is higher. We're at that next stage. We've had a car loan. I wanna be a first time home buyer. What do I do now? That's when we walk in, really start looking at our score, having that conversation with the credit union about becoming a first time home buyer. What's the score that I need? What's my credit need to look like in order to obtain this particular line of credit, a home loan. Um, in doing that work, you're gonna come across these two, these two major models, um, what we call a vintage score and FICO scores come in all sorts of variation. Um, I won't go into all the details here. I've given you a lot on the slides. But the key here is that when we're looking at credit scoring, a couple things I want you to take away from this particular slide is at this point, I think most folks are very familiar with Credit Karma. Um, there's some other uh, sites out there that do um, credit scoring. Van they use what's called a Vantage score. Okay. Now, the Vantage score, as I've indicated on the slide, you're going to see about a 30 point swing, positive or negative, in terms of its accuracy. The bottom line is Vantage scores are not used for lending purposes. They're, they're used for educational purposes. They teach you something about credit scoring, okay? But they also offer a lot of marketing and, um, you know, information. It can come in various forms. Primarily, it's intended to be educational. But a Vantage score will not, if you're focused on your Vantage score, so you're looking at your credit capacity today and you say, well, my score is 680. Well, if you're using a Vantage score, you might want to reevaluate whether or not, in fact, that's accurate for lending purposes. It won't be. So let's just clarify everything right now. If you have questions about your credit score, the Vantage score is not used for lending purposes. It's going to give you oftentimes some false hope. <laughs> um, let's focus on the major credit bureaus that I've listed over on the other side. Of the slide. So when we're thinking about the major bureaus, we're talking about Experian, Equifax, TransUnion. Um, they will generate um, uh, data, a score that is used for those types of lines that we talked about earlier in all sorts of credit credit lines, whether it's auto, mortgage, personal, you name it. Okay. So if you're thinking about credit scoring, those are the tools that you want to use for scoring purposes. Uh, it will save you a lot of time. Um, you can see here, I've laid out uh, on the slide itself um, how these models vary. Um, here's payment history that we've talked about being 35% of your overall credit score. So those late payments, just using a standard credit card or any, any other line of credit, late payments matter. And you can see that reflected, number one factor in your score, 
comes with a lot of other things packed into that that variable but uh, just take a scan through here i mean and when we think about a credit score we've got five factors that make up that score i provided the point value to uh, you as well one thing that you could do is um, and i've done this in the previous credit scoring presentation ask yourself why is my score x okay if you got a 640 you know a 680 whatever it might be you can use this tool to really kind of get a grasp on you know why is my score where it's at today um, if it's stronger it's going to be reflected in how you've used credit through time and vice versa uh, two main things here payment history and your outstanding debt outstanding debt is that is that debt ratio that we talked about earlier that's that what i call the 30 percent rule so if you're using you know particularly credit cards keeping that balance below 30 percent higher that ratio the more point value that you will lose through time so there's where you start to see how scoring comes into play and then types of credit that's listed down here as well go back again we talked about um, revolving and installment lines of credit if you only have credit cards that's where we have to think about you know expanding credit lines why well we'd like to get some point value from that as well um, so you really start to see how this model functions um, five factors that make up the score and you can see where you know payment history comes into play and how this model really interacts to build whatever score you have um, or how you've used particular lines of credit and it's impacted your overall score a um, couple things here too um, if you do uh, i wanted to to make again you aware of this come into the credit union with any of those credit scoring questions okay if you're on the call and you want to you know take a moment just to really think about what your overall personal needs are or your credit lines the tools that you need come in and work with the credit union once again as you work through the credit uh, scoring process if you do that work you know early on um, you know you can either get pre-qualified for a home loan talk about home ownership talk about improving your score so if you're in that credit scoring group where you're really trying to do the work have that conversation again about the types of products and services that you need and then let's work on figuring out strategies to improve your score or strengthen your score so you can get to that next stage in your credit journey um, <clears throat> just uh, looking at time i'm just going to go quickly through some of these factors that we uh, looked at in the model um, i would encourage you again uh, we've done uh, previous uh, full hour on credit scoring but um, and i could talk for hours on scoring alone but um, here i've laid out some of the things that you need to be aware of when you think about your overall credit score looking at those five factors that make up your score so in this slide um, I'll just highlight a couple you know again positive history has a tremendous impact through time on your overall uh, credit score because what it shows um, is your ability to make timely payments and that you're a lower risk in terms of borrowing funds you know so credit scoring again is generated to demonstrate risk you know to a lender so when you are making timely payments and you're you know you're not having a lot of negative information on the credit report itself that says a lot in terms of your overall capacity to pay back larger amounts of money through time so take a look uh, you know long after the presentation see what's packed into this beyond just you know monthly minimum payments there's a lot that can affect your overall payment history particularly this third bullet point things that you know particularly if you've had a hardship things that lead up to some of these really terrible things that can happen. But Mr. Late Payment uh, Accounts or Collection Accounts, all that factors into payment history can really do some damage to the credit score. Um, outstanding debts, this is what we talk about here with that credit utilization ratio that I talked about earlier. There's a lot of information packed into this slide as well, but again, we wanna make certain that we try to maintain low balances and um, if you do, you know, go beyond that 30%, again, we want to have a time dimension to that. You know, let's say that we need something, the car breaks down, you finance something, we go beyond 30%, that's fine. But we just don't want to be paying on that same car uh, repair two years down the road. You know what I mean? That's, that's what's most important. 
to avoid you know, a credit score impact and all the interest that we laid out earlier, let's keep that account balance low and let's really focus on keeping it to where we maintain you know, a minimum. Don't go beyond that 30% or just paying it in full. That's what's gonna have a bigger impact on your score. Um, length of credit history is a big impact. I'm gonna caution you again about opening and closing accounts. So go back and take a look at you know, why length of credit history is important. Number one, let's just make certain that we're not opening and closing accounts through time. I've laid out a lot of information on inquiries as well. Um, again, minimum score requirements are very, very important. We don't wanna just apply for things and hope that we get a line of credit. The key is that we build that relationship with the credit union, ask the questions that we've talked about tonight, and then as you go about this process, you won't have a number of hard inquiries because you've already established minimum square requirements, the type of credit that I need, and then we only have you know, that particular inquiry for that line of credit that we applied for through the credit union, okay? As opposed to all these various hard inquiries, uh, hoping that we land on something that works. Be smart about that process. Again, work directly with the credit union. And then lastly, we talked about credit mix and again, looking at revolving and installment accounts and why that's important. Think about this from a lending perspective. If you're entirely leveraged on credit cards and you need a larger loan, an installment line to do something, how does that look to a lender? Not so good. Um, <laughs> what we're talking about is can a lender really look at this in terms of having a clear um, uh, picture of risk? You know, you've got number of credit cards, but where can we look at on a credit report that shows you finance something through time in an installment line of credit, you know? So this is why it's important that you reach out to the credit union as well and really take a look at that credit mix. You know, I've only, I'm, I, right now I've got a number of credit cards, but I need to kind of diversify. You know, I need, I need to, to build in another line of credit. And this again, will have that conversation with folks that are either students or rebuilding or maybe you're just strengthening your capacity after a hardship. All those things come into play when it comes in developing that credit mix. The goal is that we have at least revolving and installment accounts, that mixture together. Um, and then lastly, I won't get too far into this because we're almost out of time, um, but I have um, listed some information in here about um, ways to just mitigate debt, uh, credit debt, um, I won't go through this section tonight in great detail, but for those folks who want to dig into this after the call, um, I've laid out three strategies here with credit utilization, interest rate, and rollover. And the goal here is really just to give you ways to focus either on, you know, paying your accounts down. Let's assume that you've got a number of cards at this point. You're trying to raise your score. This credit utilization method is a great tool where you rank order your debts from lowest to highest, and then we, we work across that spectrum to get those accounts down to 30% and then pay them off in full. The other approach that we could take is where we look at interest rates, rank order interest rates from highest to lowest, okay? And notice that I've also listed some consequences for the method. Um, some are more motivational than others. Some are prone to fatigue. But for folks who wanna focus on interest rate method, we're really focused on paying off the highest interest rate card first and really you know, uh, paying those accounts down through time, getting them down below that uh, 30%. And then lastly, what we call the rollover method. Um, and again, rank ordering from highest to lowest. Um, and the goal here is to be able to pay one card off completely and then roll all the other funds into my monthly minimum payment to reduce my debts down. Um, so that brings us to the end. I have packed us full of information tonight, closing comments from me and then I'll take questions. Um, covered a lot of ground and um, just want to, again, uh, emphasize working with us at the credit union, reach out to us at Trinity if you have any questions always here to help you. Um, I'm certainly willing to help you long after the call to look at your credit score, help you rebuild your score and work directly with the credit union to make certain that you're successful. So 
uh, with that, here's my contact information, and Kelly, I'd be glad to answer any questions. I know we went a little longer this evening. All right, thank you, Todd. Um, as Todd mentioned, we'll go ahead and open it up for the Q&A portion. So if you do have a question you'd like to ask, go ahead and submit that in the question feature, and we'll get through as many as we can. The first one is, as someone who has a great credit score who was wrongfully sent to collections, how much can that collections charge affect your credit score if it's unable to be removed? Yeah, great question. So what we're looking at here is a collection account. Um, uh, you know, the collection account, there's a couple of ways we have to think about this. One's a credit score impact, and then looking at your overall capacity as it is today. So even with that account that's charged off, there's still ways to use various types of credit that we talked about tonight to improve your overall capacity. And this comes in all sorts of variation, but you know, active open accounts. So if you've got credit cards or installment lines, those bank lines that we talked about, maintaining them, keeping them in good status, that's going to keep your score strong. Using them well, it will rebuild your score even with that, even with the charge off. But certainly, um, all that activity leading up to that event, charge off account happened. We have to deal with it at some point. And, you know, even here, here's the, what I would say about that. The charge account, you certainly want to make certain that you take care of it because at some point, you know, depending on the loan amount, it could go into legal status, which is what we want to avoid. Um, you know, we want to avoid a wage garnishment or any kind of legal action, particularly if it's over $1,500. Um, but we always look for a debt management option so we can always pay off that account through time um, that's charged off. But the bigger question for credit scoring and for lending purposes is we've got to maintain active open accounts despite the charge off account. OK, so that's where we that's where we work with the credit union to maintain a strong score, rebuild our score and then also pay off. That's that section that I talked about with credit and debt, you know, paying debt alone does not reestablish the credit score. So, um, you know, we also have to pay that account off because it's gonna have underwriting problems for any future loan that we have. But I know I'm probably going on and on about this, but here's the thing. Let us work on the credit score to make certain that we have something active and open being reported on the account. And then let's figure out also how to, you know, pay off that debt as quickly as possible despite the charge off and focus on credit scoring for lending purposes long term. All right, our next question is asking, how many credit cards do you suggest a person have at one time? <laughs> yeah, this is a great question. Um, you know, in the previous slide, you know, FICO lays out a rule of thumb. They, they say no more than seven credit cards. I would strongly caution against that. Um, I think three credit cards is, you know, pretty um, pretty reasonable to maintain. I would not suggest you go beyond three. Now, and this could come in some variation. You may have a major credit card of some sort, maybe a couple major credit cards, and then some type of card, say Best Buy or, you know, from a larger um, store that you like to shop at, that sort of thing. But, you know, really what we're trying to, to maintain is a strong credit mix. So three credit cards really, you know, if you have, you know, if you have a couple credit cards that are active and open, you're you're below 30%, you're using them, uh, using them correctly as we've laid out tonight, you know, and you're making a couple purchases and paying that off through time, not accumulating a large amount of debt, not falling into a monthly minimum, you know, debt trap, I would suggest not going over three. You know, I've worked with Trinity now for, I think, for almost 15 years. I can certainly tell you that once you reach seven credit cards, you've got a major debt problem. Just in terms of us being able to, you know, have access to all those lines. Most of us don't have the restraint that we would hope. <laughs> uh, we really get ourselves into a lot of trouble. Just offhand, just really kind of have some restraint. Three credit cards, no more than three credit cards. And... Um, Ideally, it'd be great just to have one major credit card with a higher balance, but oftentimes it's not as practical. So my my tip for you would be, you know, three cards maximum and just keep those balances low, keep them paid down, keep them paid off ideally. But if you do use them, no more than three credit cards and let's make sure that we're also 
focusing as well on an installment line, building our overall credit capacity. All right, Todd, do you have time for a couple more questions? I do, sure, go ahead. Okay, the next one is, um, it's asking, why is my credit score stagnant? Well, this is, um, you know, this is one of those questions that um, I would have to look at your overall credit report itself to be able to, to clearly answer that question. But if you go back to, to the uh, section where we talked about credit scoring, those first two factors say a lot. Okay, so if it's not a payment history question, that is, we haven't had major charge-offs or we haven't had consistent uh, payment uh, problems, late payments, uh, something along those lines, hardship of some sort that caused us to, you know, carry um, uh, or have a couple late payments, something in the payment history itself. If it's not that factor, stagnant scores tend to fall into credit debt, credit debt ratio issues. That is that utilization, that 30% rule that I talked about. So um, what I often find is folks will have, they build their score and then through time it becomes stagnant because they've carried too much debt. Um, that, that tends to be one of the reasons why. Um, now you can, uh, you know, if you wanted me to look into that in more detail, you can contact me directly with the uh, information that you see on the slide. I can pull a credit report for, for you and we can really dive in there and just, you know, really work our way through that process and I can answer that question in great detail. But um, generally, it's a credit debt ratio issue. So if there's a number of debts in there that are beyond 30 percent and you're making, you know, you're keeping up with payments, nothing is, you know, charged off at this point or anything like that, it, the more we can change the credit debt ratio, the better. Um, you'll, you'll start to see that score move through time. Uh, the other thing could be um, strengthening the overall, looking for point value. You know, we might look at some way to manipulate point value through the credit mix itself. So I hope that helps. It's usually one of those two factors, um, but to give you, you know, an accurate read on that, just call me directly, let me know, just say, hey, I was on the uh, webinar. Uh, I'd like for you to take a look at my credit report happy to do that for you all right let's get to just a couple more questions um this one's asking about trinity what types of debt can trinity help manage is there a fee and what is the process yes so with trinity we work um we work primarily with credit cards um what we call unsecured debt so this these are debts that are not tied to some type of collateral um, most of the debts that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis are credit cards. That's the biggest uh, part of the debt that we manage. Um, the process is very simple. Um, you just, you give me a call, we run a credit report. Um, we look at your overall, uh, your overall debts. Um, the big payoff on the debt management program is the interest rate reduction. Um, so if you have higher interest rates, debt management or nonprofit credit counseling agencies are the only way to really reduce interest rates. That's not only unique to Trinity, but that's just a function of nonprofit credit counseling. Um, but there's no real requirement other than uh, us taking a look at your overall debt. Uh, and at that point, we are able to tell you what your overall interest rates would be. And we work directly with creditors to reduce your rates. Um, and I'd be glad to, you know, talk with you about the debt management process itself. Basically, all you do, you make one monthly payment to Trinity and we pay all of your creditors at a reduced interest rate. It's very, very simple. And I can, I can answer any questions that you have offline, you know, after the call. All right. And then we'll finish with this question. Um, it says, I'm afraid to get a credit card and know nothing about them, but I want to build my credit. What would you suggest I do? Yeah, afraid to get a credit card, I understand. Um, you know, and I've said this many times throughout the call, don't be afraid of credit. You know, you need, you need a credit card to fully participate in our economy. It's just the bottom line. It is, it's core, having a major credit card or having a line of credit, it's just absolutely important in terms of building your overall capacity. That is your ability to borrow at a larger level, a larger amount, 
particularly home loans, car loans, things that are higher dollar. Um, don't be afraid. You know, that's one of the things that we hope that you will take away from the call tonight is having um, some confidence, uh, understanding a little bit about credit, how it functions, why it's important. But if you have any questions about that, really reach directly out to the credit union. OK, and just let them know your concerns. You know, I want a credit card. I want to be able to use this uh, to, to build you know, some capacity. Um, maybe I need a secured credit line. That is, maybe you need to put some collateral up front, get a secure credit line. Maybe your score is not where it needs to be at this point, but you need a card. A secured credit line would be a very easy way to start that process. A small dollar installment loan through the credit union would be a great tool to use to establish your overall credit capacity and get that started. Um, and then I would encourage you just to continue to participate in the webinar series. I mean, uh, Kelly and the credit union, they do outstanding work through the webinar series not only talking about the issue tonight, credit, but other financial topics, the more you learn, the more confidence that you will have and, the, and see those interactions between credit and other parts of personal finance. But um, long story short, you know, again, reach out, use me as a resource. You've got my contact information here. I'd be glad to work with you and help, uh, help you in any way, answer any questions that you have. And then, you know, I could work with you directly and then also contact the credit union and we'll get you set up in a line that meets your needs and helps you uh, build the credit capacity that you need to be successful. All right, thank you, Todd. That's going to conclude tonight's webinar. Thank you all for joining us and have a great rest of your evening.